Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full showtimes, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Ian Collins. He's the founder and CEO of Wisdom.ai. Ian, welcome to the show. Kevin, great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you guys are doing at uh, Wisdom.ai is really, really innovative and cool. But maybe before we get into that stuff, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure, sure. Sounds good. Uh, I grew up around the Toronto area in okay. Canada. Very cool. Uh, you know, bo born and raised, uh, you know, early childhood. Actually lived in Saudi Arabia for a couple of years in, uh, you know, sort of end of elementary school before high school. Yeah, I went, went back to high school here around the Toronto area. Okay. Uh, this is, you know, this is going back in the 80s, you know, pretty long time ago, I hate to admit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, grew up here, uh, you know, great city, great place, you know, big family, uh, north of the city, beautiful lake country and stuff like that. So I sure. spent a lot of time up there. And it was Muskoka, just, uh, right? You know, all around is, great that, place. is that where you're talking? Yeah, yeah, Muskoka. Yeah, that, okay. That's it, yeah. Very cool. So you went to university. What did you take and why? Yeah, a couple of degrees. You know, when you when you start out, you're coming out of high school, you really have no idea. So my dad and brother were both engineers, so I just took an engineering degree. Okay. And uh, for no no great reason other than it you know, seemed like a solid foundation. And I went to a school up here, up here called Ryerson uh, yeah. University. Sure. And uh, I got a civil engineering degree and, uh, you know, started out with sort of a, a good foundation and and got me a couple of good jobs fresh out of school. And, uh, you know, and then just after a couple of years after graduating, I realized engineering really wasn't the long term uh, future, probably for me, I mean, okay. hardcore doing design and stuff. It was entertaining for a while, but I, I had uh, ideas I was going to do a little more, you know, broad, uh, you know, cover more ground. So I went back to school, got an MBA at a school up here called McMaster University, sure. yep. uh, which is close around the Toronto area as well. And spent two years in there, you know, got a business education to go with the engineering uh, side and always thought that was a good combination. Those two really set you up well for, you know, for whatever you're going to do for the rest of your life. Sure. So did you do that full time or did you do that part time or, or how did you do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I did it full time. Okay. I went, I had worked two years. I'd been out in the workforce, and seen, you know, seeing the real world sure. and decided, you know, I want to do this MBA. So I went back full time for two years. Which was tough to give up the big paycheck. Yeah, I can imagine. Get used to a certain life. You know, you finally graduate after four years of university of being a poor student and, you know, scrimping and scraping. Sure. And uh, you're out there making a pretty good salary. You know, back in those days, you know, we were, we were paid pretty well. I worked for a company up here called Rogers, you know, one of the sure. big telcos yeah. back in the early days. It used to be called Cantel. This is really early days of wireless. And uh, did that for a couple of years and decided, you know, long term, it's going to make sense to make this investment. Went back to school full time for two years, which was tough. Back sure. to the student life, no money, you know, pretty <laughs> tight budget, but uh, really had a great time. You know, school is school is a, you know a great place. It's a it's a wonderful environment. No, that that makes a lot of sense. So, walk me through your career up until Wisdom.ai because you've done a ton of stuff. Yeah, had have quite a few companies. So, so I got out of MBA and got back into the telco industry. Okay. Worked for a Toronto-based, you know, not a startup exactly. They were pretty well funded with a couple hundred million bucks to sure. build a technology that nobody would remember anymore. It was called CT2 Plus. Okay. It was this it was this Japanese standard, these little tiny flip phones, and it was basically a Wi-Fi like standard where you had these little base stations all in these dense areas like shopping malls and stuff. And we were building out Toronto. We were we, the company owned the license for this technology. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I spent a, a year or so there out of school, and uh, you know, got back into the telco industry. Uh, after that, moved over to what now is Telus. It was used to be called ClearNet. Spent a year or so, and the technology we were building there was called IDEN. If, okay. people, if you remember this old push to talk thing, yeah, remember, yeah, um, totally. Yeah, remember that company? What was that? Uh, 
the big U.S. company that had that push to talk thing. It got bought yeah. by Sprint or somebody later. I know um, what you're talking about, that, but the name escapes yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. I can't. I can't remember the name, but it was it was big for a while, and it, it morphed into a you know they had basic cellular was, as well, but they really pushed the contractor market and stuff. We built out a, a network here in in Ontario and Quebec and Canada. And 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 I was uh, running the you know project manager on on that, cool. and then got that bug to to start a company. Okay. So this you know I hate to admit how long ago this was. This is like ninety four, ninety five. No, no, and, there's nothing uh, wrong with that, man. Yeah. I think it's great. <laughs> it's going back a while, yeah. Yep. And I had a a buddy we were working with, and we started. We thought we were going to start our first company, and a c- couple of guys. There was actually four of us in the in the beginning, and it turned out to be two after couple guys bailed you know kind of long story sure but yeah, um happens. we had this idea we're gonna we're gonna start our first company not knowing anything at all okay. and this is before being an being an entrepreneur was cool sure we really you know didn't know what to do and you know how you were gonna do it there wasn't a lot of venture capital or mentors around so we started a consulting company okay and we we locked into this particular market there was a lot of of the first generation of digital networks you know we'd gone from no G's, you, you know, the early yep. days it was analog networks. Yep. And then the digital networks were just emerging, you know, 1G. You know, we're going from 4G to 5G today. Yep. This is 1G in the 90s. And, and all around the world, uh, people were building these networks. In Canada, for some reason back in those days, we were a couple of years ahead of everybody else. Yeah. And we'd been working in, in the industry and we knew all these great engineers, you know, switch engineers, transmission engineers, RF engineers. And these guys are, you know, super smart, and they just happen to be working these telcos with us. And everybody around the world, we realized, was looking for that kind of talent and skill. Interesting. So we we hired all these guys and farmed them out around the world in Asia and Europe. Wow. To all these other telcos, and we grew a pretty big team, fifty or so, you know, people we had working for us, um, you know, and and send them all over the world on these different projects. Right. And uh, and business was good. It was it was the mid nineties. You know, the, the industry was booming. People would pay anything for talent because they, they had all made these promises to, you know, governments or shareholders that sure. they were going to have a network up overnight. And it's always, you know, it never happens, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so it really worked out. Yeah, really, really worked out well. And it, it uh, allowed us to get into business, you know, learn the basics, pay the bills, sock away a bit of cash. Uh, but then, of course, we had the bug to start a software business. Okay. You know, this, is, this is back in the days of... Uh, you know, Microsoft was, was big, you know, sure. a big player back then. One of the first big ones, you know, Bill Gates is, you know, one of those first real entrepreneurs that everybody heard of and knew and became a billionaire. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we were making good money okay. in the consulting business, but we realized, you know, this is just, you know, day to day, month after month, we're producing a pretty good profit. But at the end of the day, the company didn't have any value. We were trying to understand how did these company shares become valuable you know, beyond us, just put money in our, in our pockets every month. Um, and we, you know, realized the company had to have this basic value and that came from the software world. Uh, okay. And we had been working with telcos all around the world and we got to understand, you know, the back office of the telcos because that's where our team worked typically. And we started to see a lot of need, a lot of needs emerge. Sure. So we were, you know, we were in Asia, we were in Europe and we we're talking to all these, uh, you know, execs, that were running these networks and they were all asking for certain products. Okay. And Interesting. And, uh, and the internet, you know, it's just emerging. This is 97, 98. You know, the internet is this really basic primitive thing. The old, the Netscape browser, you know, that, that sort of famous, uh, turn had just happened and everybody's amazed by how you can, you know, browse, uh, you know, the world on this really nice graphic, uh, browser. Yep. And, you know, so, so that's all happening. And we decided we're going to start a software company okay. based on what we've seen in the telco industry. So, so we kind of sell off our shares in the consulting business, okay. take our cash and invest it in a company, you know, and start building software. We've been dabbling on the side and we spent a, you know, a year and a half and, and a lot of our, our engineering talent, when they were back in the office, you know, sitting on the bench, we'd put them to work building, building some of our products. Sure. And that company was called, was called Wisdom as well. That's where Wisdom originally came from. So uh, uh, okay. we had it was it, it was wisdom dot com, sure. and we and the idea was taking dot coms wireless. So we saw these all these dot com companies, and we were gonna you know extend them out into the wireless world. You know, push them in people's pockets and sure. you know early generation phones. It was real simple text messaging and stuff back in those days. 
So, uh, so we started building up this product set that you could install in the back office of a, uh, of a, you know, telco. And then we would, uh, you know, sign up, uh, dot coms. Like we had car rental companies, uh, airlines that wanted to send out notifications. Sure. You know, your, your, your rental car is ready. Your flight is delayed early days of that kind of stuff. Very cool. And we started, we started selling that stuff. So, so business went pretty well, you know, it's 98, 99, we're signing up customers and things are going pretty well. And now it's, it's our first attempt at trying to raise money. Okay. So we'd, we'd gone from a consulting, a consulting business and where, you know, it just produces good cash flow. you know, with the pro it was pretty profitable and uh, we're socking away a lot of money and, and crazy, you know, crazy or not, we had reinvested most of that money into our software dreams. Sure. And now we got to this point, we said, okay, we've got to go out and raise money. And, you know, where does this come from? Again, these are the days before, you know, there was all these blogs and all this information. And, you know, and, I mean, Silicon Valley obviously was, was a, a tech center, but yeah, yeah, venture yeah. capital was still relatively unknown sure. in the, you know, in the backwater. Well, like especially Toronto, in Eastern really Canada, outside, outside right? Valley. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So we really were outside of the, you know, that startup world. Sure. So we go out, start knocking the doors. We're talking to all kinds of people, trying to find you know venture capitalists, or it was more angels back in those days. There weren't a lot of VCs in Toronto. Sure. We're shopping around for money, and uh, we we fly down to the valley now and then and tell our story. And uh, it's you know ninety nine the dot com bubble's getting going. It's pretty hot, but still nobody wants to talk to us. Everybody says wireless. Ah, that's boring. You know dot com is where it is. Huh. And, you know if you had anything to do with dot com, people would just throw money at you. Sure. But wireless. Didn't want anything to do with it. That's telco. That's boring. It's, it's really dull. And, uh, and then it's the summer of 99. Okay. And we've got two big clients. You know, we've got a, uh, you know, six, eight, ten clients. Okay. But two of them are paying most of the bills. Okay. They're two, two big internet companies. I forget. It was like, it was like a company called Lycos back then. I think it might yeah, have been Lycos. Yeah, yeah. And, okay, sure. And Search somebody engine, right? else liked that, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. Yeah, these brands, these brands that are gone. And yep. both projects, for some reason, get put on hold. They don't, they don't cancel, but they put them on hold. Okay. And uh, we, we've got a staff of, you know, 50 people or so, and we've been, you know, kind of keeping it together. And all of a sudden, things are tight. Wow. And it's the summer of 99, and we're like, damn it, you know, what happened? Um, so we're out shopping harder than ever, trying to raise money. You know, we're, we're slowly learning the ropes. What do you say? How do you do a pitch deck? Who sure. do you talk to? Where do you find the investors? And things are getting a little grim and now into the fall. And uh, we're actually headed for bankruptcy. You know, we can't we can't pay the bills. Sometime in November, probably we're gonna we're gonna it's still gonna unravel. Okay. And uh, and then back in those days, there was a big show called Comdex. Yeah, it was I remember the biggest that. tech show of the year. Sure. You remember that one? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. been gone for a long time, yeah. but Bill Gates was Bill Gates was always the keynote. Sure. And he would he would open the thing up on a Sunday night, and the Sunday night of '99, I forget the, the time. It's like early November of 1999. Bill Gates goes up and his message basically is wireless is the next big thing. Interesting. And uh, he says, you know, the, yeah, the internet's big, but wireless, that's where the action is. Everybody's going to take it to their pocket. And he had a, he had coined a phrase. I forget what it was. And then the phone starts ringing. You know, we actually had phones in those days in the office. People are phoning us now wanting to invest in our company. Interesting. So it's just, it, it turned overnight. We were wow. weeks away from bankruptcy and we, we closed our venture around in, a, you know, about three weeks. Wow. You know, uh, you know, found, got a bridge from the bank to keep in business and make payroll at the end of the month and, uh, and raised a pile of money. Wow. And yeah, and then, uh, you know, amazing. and then things were crazy. Then, then we couldn't, you know, we, we were turning away the money. We raised, we raised about 7 million bucks that, okay. that fall. And three months later in March, we raised another 50 million. Wow. Um, you know, on a, you know, and we had, we had offers or orders on our fundraising tour of 200 million and we wow. had to turn away 150, 150 million bucks. It wow. was just, they were just crazy times. Sure. But, uh, you know, but, but there's clearly, clearly a lesson in there that, you know, it's not always about you and your business, right? The environment changes. It's, it's the buzz. It's the, yeah. uh, you know, what's going on around you and, and influencers, you know, these days, in, in those days, you know, Bill Gates was the guy, right? He was the richest sure. guy in the world. Yeah. He was the Microsoft guy. There weren't a lot of companies, with you know people with that kind of profile and uh and people listened of course you know so sure. all the investors you know really hung on his word so so it was wisdom so wisdom grew and uh now we're you know a couple of guys with 60 million bucks in the bank wow and uh started growing the business 
you know, hiring people like crazy. People are offering to buy us for, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. <laughs> and the board, of course, is like craziness. You can't sell the company, you know, it's going to be worth billions. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pure insanity. Okay. It was, it was really crazy time. We, we acquired a few companies and it was, it was, it was so backward back in those days that we would go and acquire a company. We bought this one really great little company out of Boston. Okay. And, uh, and uh, they had a good little, uh, you know, core product that would be a, a nice add-on to our portfolio or, you know, kind of our suite. Sure. And uh, we're haggling the deal with these guys. And, um, you know, whatever the price is, you know, it might have been 10 or 20 million bucks. Sure. And they said, you know, we want all stock. And we said, no, we want to pay you all cash. Okay. And we would fight until we could come with a, you know, come up. But, you know, typically the seller wants cash and the buyer wants to pay stock. And this was the opposite. Interesting. They wanted all stock. Wow. They thought the stock was going to, you know, continue to, you know, appreciate so fast. They didn't want a penny of cash and wow. we didn't want to pay, you know, we didn't want to pay a penny of stock because we thought the cash was basically free and the, you know, the stock sure. was the most valuable thing. So wow. we haggled, you know, ended up at 50, 50, 50 or something. So okay. it was just so, so crazy and backwards. But wow. uh, anyway, so the, the company grew, we got, we got, grew to three or 400 people growing like crazy. And then of course the crash comes along Sure. and, uh, the customers all dry up. We got, you know, at, at its peak, you know, in the you know late 2000s, we're, you know, 30, probably 40, pretty good sized clients. Things are looking good. You know, the, the revenue is rolling and it starts to dry up, right? The dot com sure. all stop spending money because this is the dot, dot com crash. Nobody knows what's going on. If it's ever going to come back, you know, the NASDAQ could drop by half or something. Sure. And uh, the company slowly, you know, so then the, then the, you know, then the, uh, the structural challenges uh, start to appear. You know, when, when times are good, uh, you know, life is easy, right? Sure. You're, you're growing, you're spending, everybody's in agreement on what needs to be done. When sure. times are bad, yeah, it's just the opposite. Everybody's got a different idea. Sure. So we, so the, the board all, you know, has different ideas. The board, you know, is fairly big by the time after raising 60 million bucks. Sure. Uh, you know, we had brought on a fairly big board, investors all over the place. Not all professional investors. You know, in those days, a lot of pension funds were, were investing in stuff. Right. So we had a pretty diverse and big board <laughs> that all had different ideas. And, uh, and you find your voice really starts to, uh, you know, be diluted or, you know, people don't listen to what you say, basically. Sure. And uh, by 2001, I found, you know, I just, you know, I couldn't drive the company. You know, I couldn't basically have much influence anymore. It was a big company with, you know, big board, a lot of people with their money in, which is perfectly reasonable. They've written sure. massive checks. Got you. And they yeah. wanted to drive in a certain direction. And I decided it was time to move on. So, so I moved on in 2001. Okay. But the company and, continued? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the company went okay. on for another five years. I mean, it was a lot of money. Sure. It was, yeah, it was, I guess. It was, hey? big, like, yeah. it was a big bank account. Yeah. And uh, and luckily back in those days, we learned what a secondary was. So, you know, my co-founder and I, we'd never heard of this thing called a secondary. Okay. What but, is it for uh, people that CFO don't know? Time, yeah. So a secondary is this wonderful thing where you, you know, if somebody's going to invest $10 million in your, into your company, yeah. uh, typically the 10 million bucks goes into the bank account. And you issue shares out of the bank account, uh, you're out of the company to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, put shares in the pocket of your investor, the 10 right. million bucks goes into the company. A secondary is a little something on top of that. You'd say, okay, we're doing a $10 million investment and a secondary of five. And the five actually is purchase, you're purchasing shares of the existing shareholders. So the shareholders get to cash out along the way. Right, uh, and we, you know, we had done some, uh, you know, a really nice secondary when we raised the fifty million. I can imagine. So sure. <laughs> all, you know, yeah, a lot of the early shareholders were, you know, very happy. So they sure. they did, you know, really really well, including you know my co-founder and I. Well, that's good. Um, man. That's great. So yeah, it was it was great. It was at the peak. You know, was, the timing was good, and, and uh, you know, so it it worked out for many people, but late investors, you know, not so much. Well, so, when, the fact so the, that you made it yeah. through the first uh, dot com crash, yeah. right? And yeah, and made that's a ton it. of money, right? Like, not a lot of people <laughs> yeah. would say that, so, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's two companies in. And then I decided to take a year off, 
you know, I'm going to do, you. I'm going to do nothing for a year, you know, okay. really kick back. Did and, you actually do and, nothing um, for a year? Like actually? Yep. A whole, a whole year. Yeah. From nice. I left in October and I didn't do anything until, until September. I mean, I did all kinds of things, but sure. no work. Not work. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you traveled or yeah, whatever. Just vacation. Lots of the yeah. 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 Okay, lots, awesome. lots of great things. Obvious, so, sure. And, uh, and then I had an idea cooking. So I started my next company in late 2002. Okay. Um, with, uh, my current co-founder, actually, we started three companies together and we, we started this company called Mobile Diagnostics. Okay. And we had we had this idea that uh, smartphones, you know, had just emerged. Sure. So this is the early days of smartphones. There's really there's no I, iPhones yet. It, you know, the Windows phones. You know, Windows yeah. were big. I remember this those. Operating yeah. system called Symbian. Yeah. yeah. And they were really these primitive phones. But basically, the telcos, which we knew fairly well, sure. all had this challenge uh, where you know everybody had flip phones before that, and these smartphones sure. just emerged. And people typically had called in over the, you know, the decade before saying, hey, I dropped a call or, you know, I don't understand my bill. Now, all of a sudden, they're calling in to the telco saying, hey, I can't get my email, right? I can't browse the web. Yeah, I can't do these, you know, smartphone things. Sure. And they didn't know, didn't, you know, they just couldn't adapt. They didn't really see it coming. So we built a really nice little tool set that let a customer service rep sit in front of their screen if they had our software installed on their, on their um, you know, CRM or on their uh, system. Right. They could click a button, look over the air into the customer's phone that they were actually talking to. We'd suck up all the settings out of that customer's phone and present it to the CSR in, you know, the round trip was five to 10 seconds. So wow. we could be talking right That's now quick. and you, you know, I, I'm the CSR and I'd say, hang on a sec, Kevin, I'm going to have a look at your phone. Okay. And I'd, I'd click the button. It'd pop up on my screen and say, ah, I see Kevin, you've got this kind of phone. Here's your settings. And back in those days, you know, the settings could get screwed up pretty easily. Sure. Yeah. And we'd highlight, days. <laughs> we'd highlight. Yeah, it was, there was this, this one setting called the APN and it was like your, uh, I forget. It was like a gateway address at your telco. Anyway, it, it went wrong all the time. It was, sure. had to be provisioned, right? And it was always get screwed up. And, uh, you know, in many cases we'd highlight that to the CSR and say, oh, this setting is wrong. And in many cases they could, they could change it and push it back into your phone. Wow. So, uh, so it was, it was a good little product. We sold it to a bunch of telcos and, uh, and we were partnering with uh you know one of our partners uh was this company called bitphone out of la okay and uh we were we were actually i don't know if um if you ever went to the mobile world congress back in the early days it used no, to be on I the mediterranean sure. in in france wow that doesn't sound terrible it was at all this, <laughs> no it was beautiful it was it was this this smoky little conference center in Cannes, in sure. uh, you know where the film festival is right you know, really spot, but it's right on the water in this okay. beautiful little town. And we'd go every year. Nice. And the beauty of it was, is along the side, it's, it's basically, you know, sitting on the water, uh, you know, on the coast there. Sure. And on one side was, was this dock. And you could, you know, rather than rent a booth, you would rent a yacht for the week. Wow. And you would do your business on the yacht. And it was, it, you know, it was just great. So we, <laughs> we shared a yacht one, one year. With this, with this company called Bitphone, they were our partner, and we were okay. we were both doing business, you know, a steady stream. And people would come out of this smoky, cramped conference center, you know, it was a pretty old building, sure. and come out in some yacht with you, and they just, it was just heaven. They didn't want to leave. Sure, so you, ha- you know, you'd you'd have a steady stream of meetings. Everybody you wanted to meet was happy to come and see you because you had this, <laughs> this beautiful, uh, this beautiful place. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Uh, it was it was so great. But uh, anyway, so our, our partner we were there with saw this steady stream. Every big telco, you know, like in Europe and North America yeah. was coming to see us okay. and was really interested in this thing. And we, we got talking and they said, you know, we really should, you know, buy you basically, you know, we should partner. You do the dance initially and say, mm-hmm. oh, we should really be closer and yeah, that yeah. kind of thing, which means we should, you know, we should buy you. Sure. And uh, we haggled for six months or so until a deal appeared that uh you know the shareholders all liked and we we sold the company to them nice and yeah kind of late summer you know early fall of that year which is which is now like 2005 ish okay. i can't remember exactly something like okay. that okay sounds good and uh yeah so so we we sold that company and uh which then went on to get be sold to hp a year or so later Interesting. And, uh, you know, so we, we uh, rolled up and, uh, and it became an HP product eventually, which was a whole other story. HP was in wireless and they were out. And that was a, a whole bunch of craziness. So, so then my co-founder and I went on to start another company. Okay. So now it's, it's 2006, you know, late, maybe two, uh, late 2006. And 
And, uh, you know, digital music, digital photos are just taking off. You sure. know, everybody's, yeah. everybody's finally got a digital camera. Uh, digital music, you know, it's, it's the, um, uh, you know, the early days. There's really not a lot of streaming, so everybody's downloading a lot of music. Sure. It's the days of Nap- Napster. Yeah, people are amassing these huge music collections. And, <laughs> yeah, even, even the legal connection, you know, collections, people are downloading music all over the place. And it's just getting going, but um, you know, you're downloading onto your hard drive basically this these collections of music or photos. Sure. And you know, then your then your drive crashes, of course, and you lose it all. Sure. Your your photos from years of you know weddings and vacations they vanish in a second, yeah. and all your music's gone. And, and trying to get it back is a pain. Plus, all your regular stuff, you know, sure. your business documents and everything. So, so we had this thought that the whole world isn't backing up. You know, backing up is boring and and dull. And, and there's you know, in those days, there's, there's no drop boxes of, sure. of the world where, yeah. you know, the, the cloud's way too expensive. So we built this, we had this idea that the world needs this device. It's so simple. You take it out of the box, you plug it into your USB, you know, port on your PC and you walk away. Okay. You don't install anything. You don't set it up. It doesn't ask you any questions, like absolutely nothing. You, wow. you plug it in, you go get a coffee and you come back and it gives you a nice big check mark. And it says everything you care about on that computer you plugged it into is all backed up and safe. Then you go stick this thing in the closet. Okay. And uh, so we we put an engineering team on it, and we called it Click Free. Okay. Uh, you know the idea was you know there's no clicking. You know back Makes in those sense. days. Yeah. You know and it was a huge deal. So, yeah. Yeah, we sold millions of those things. Okay. So we we started wow. we started selling them on TV because every you know everybody kind of understood roughly like oh I should back this thing up. Yeah. You know, people didn't really know what backup was, but I shot a second copy of all this stuff because sure. all these photos and music, you know, are, are pretty interesting. Yep. And uh, nobody did it, of course, because it was a pain. Sure. I didn't even, I didn't do it myself. But this <laughs> thing was so easy that people would do it. Okay. And we sold millions. You know, we sold them on TV shopping all around the world. We, had, we sold them in 50 countries. Wow. And, uh, you know, the thing took off. It was growing like crazy. We had, you know, crazy big, you know, offers to buy the company. And, uh, you know, things were really going well, except we were in the hardware business Yeah, and okay, hardware is a, hardware is a tough business. Yeah. And we had, a, there was a, there was a couple of natural disasters that, uh, caused us grief. Okay. You know, one was, uh, there was that tsunami in Japan Remember, yeah. and there was a nuclear, uh, reactor, I, Fukushima, I think it was called. Yeah. And, yeah, okay. uh, the tsunami took the thing out, wiped it out. And there was this radiation zone, like 50 miles or something around this nuclear wow. reactor. And, uh, and little did everybody know, but within a couple of miles of that nuclear reactor was a factory that made half of all the world's hard drive motors. There's this, oh, this wow. tiny little motor that, that spins that disc, you know, at sure. a couple thousand RPMs. And half of all the motors were made at this factory, and it was, you know, in the radiation zone and shut down. And, sure. and overnight, you couldn't buy a hard drive because HP and Dell and all the big guys back in those days bought up all the inventory for the next year. And wow. little guys like us were totally locked out of the market. Wow. So all, all I sudden, didn't got, know that. Got, oh, yeah. We got distribution all around the world in 50 countries. Wow. People screaming at us. The, sh- the shelves are empty. And we can't, we can't fulfill. Right? We can't ship wow. products because we can't buy. Even if you wanted to buy it three times the price, you couldn't even get your hands on it. Wow. So there was, <laughs> that's the hardware business. And it's just so tough. You know, something comes up and the best product in the world you know, hardware will really come back and bite you, you know, sometimes. So, so the company, you know, bumped along, went, went okay. But uh, we had brought in a really, you know, a superstar CEO, uh, a consumer electronics uh, guru had, you know, built and sold, a, you know, a big brand and, uh, and he was running the show. So, you know, I thought, you know, good time to, to move on and, and do something new. Okay. And, uh, and along, you know, comes this idea for Wisdom AI. Okay. And all these years, I had, I had kept that wisdom.com uh, domain. Nice. And we, we actually started the company, and the company was called Crowdcare. Okay. And our product was called Wisdom. But okay. uh, then I had that domain all these years. And as we morphed more and more into this machine learning and AI world, we realized Wisdom was what we were selling. Sure. And I just happened to own this wisdom.com domain. I, I kept it all the years. And, uh, you know, we, we obviously grabbed wisdom.ai sure. and, you know, and, and repositioned the company as, as that. And then, you know, wisdom, wisdom.ai was born. Okay. So what exactly and, is and, wisdom.ai and why did you decide to start it up? Yeah. So, yeah. So wisdom, you know, the, the initial idea really came from, it was, it was similar to this mobile diagnostics thing that we had done years earlier, okay. uh, where we had seen the ability 
to look over the air into the device and and gather a lot of data. And you're you know this is now 2000 and you know 11, 12, 13, and natural language processing is just emerging. Sure. You know this early days of you know using machine learning and NLP to understand a phrase. You know what was the customer's intent rather than the old keyword days. You know for sure. a, a decade or more we'd had keyword search tools that just took the literal words and said, okay, where do I find these words in, in something else? And, you know, that should be a match for, for what this person's looking for. But NLP emerged, but we were on our phone and you'd go to Google and you could see Google had started to use NLP, uh, you know, back in those days. Um, and you were on a, you know, an iPhone or something. And you'd say, why is my battery life stink? And it would give you a 10 million results, sure. but it wouldn't even know the phone that was in your hand. And we thought, you know, that doesn't make any sense. We know we can gather all this data from this device. And, Interesting. Because you did the, it up before, was, right? Yeah, we had done it. And yeah. we thought this NLP tech is obviously, you know, the future. It's going to get better and better at, you know, breaking down that sentence and constantly, you know, using these machine learning models to improve and understand and interpret and predict what this customer is talking about. But if we inject, you know, hundreds or thousands of data points from that we know about this customer, and combine those two, we're going to have a much better system. It's going to be, you know, just a better mousetrap. So we we started building that system back in in 2012, and and in the early days we called it CrowdCare because we were going to actually we we thought we would go out and crowdsource a lot of this information. We would go out and, and gather a lot of knowledge from you know the masses generally, and and what they said and what they learned, and and we would build this uh, knowledge set. Uh, you know, kind of library of, of data, um, you know, so, as, you know, that part of the idea wasn't, wasn't crystal clear. And we had tested it. We had okay. gone out and, and tested some, some public products. But uh, what we found, what we settled on really was we went to our old friends at Rogers sure. and said, you know, we, we built this new system. It uses this natural language processing tech and we, are, we combine it with a lot of customer data to really understand them well. And we can understand them, we can satisfy or understand the need, and we'll probably satisfy them. And they won't end up in your contact center. And, uh, and Roger said, you know, that's a great idea. We, you know, really love the thought of it. They were, you know, innovative enough to, to take a chance on a young company. Sure. And uh, they said, let's go for it. We're going to give you guys, you know, of Rogers has about 10 million subscribers. Sure. They said, we're going to give you about half a million subscribers in this one particular category. And we'll give this thing a run and see how it works. Interesting. And, and sorry, yeah, no, and, yeah, no, sorry, sorry, no I was go just going to say, just for people that don't know, Rogers is a big cellular carrier in Canada. Just it, like an AT&T yeah, type yeah. thing. It'd be comparable. Yeah, yeah. Or Verizon. Yeah, they're or the biggest. Like yeah. yeah, yeah, they're the biggest in Canada. Yeah, yeah they sell you know cable, cable TV, yeah. wireless, yeah. Uh, home phone, the usual internet, full service yeah. package. Yeah. yeah, internet. Yeah, well, all that stuff. Okay. So. So, uh, yeah, with, with 10 million or so subscribers, they said, here's half a million. Let's give it a test. And, uh, you know, we believe this is kind of an interesting idea. And uh, back in those days, it was mostly behind a search bar. You know, the conversational okay. stuff really hadn't emerged yet. Right. But what we did with Rogers is we said, you know, these new machine learning models really need regular attention. And it's not something we're going to build and deploy and then leave alone. It's something we're going to, you know, set up. We're going to try and understand as much as we can before we launch. But then the real work begins after we launch. Once we launch this, we're going to listen to the customers sure. every day, understand where our system worked and where it didn't, and constantly manage the models and try and improve the system. And we said, let us do that for you. We will be the operators, basically, of the system. And Roger said, yeah, you guys do it. We don't have that talent in our organization we don't have, you know, engineers and experts and we don't, you know, really understand, you know, know what uh, it's going to take to accomplish that. So that really became core to our business model is we weren't going to sell software, you know, even, you know, cloud-based software. We were going to sell SaaS. And this is the early days of, of SaaS. Sure. So it was our product with the service to, to manage it, to optimize it every single day. And that really became core. Um, and it, you know, and it worked great. It really was super effective. Everybody was happy with the results. We, you know, outperformed all of our, our uh, expectations and, and we started rolling out more brands. We started landing. And it, again, the theory in the early days was uh, if you stick to one industry, you're going to build up this, this sort of critical mass of knowledge in that particular industry, these machine learning models and utterances and intent, and the reusability is going to be really high. Sure. So we focused, we focused on the telco industry. 
Okay. And we landed, uh, you know, a half dozen or so other telcos. And, uh, and the thesis proved to be true. It really was highly reusable. In that industry, whether you're in Japan or Australia or, you know, anywhere in North America or, you know, Mexico, South America, people are asking the same things. It's like yeah, in the summer, so. fall, they say, when, when can I get a new iPhone? Sure. Yeah, they, you know, they say, why <laughs> yeah. is my bill so high? You know, yeah. why, yeah, how does this work? And, and all those kinds of things. And then it, it naturally, you know, starting about three years ago, it started to morph into a conversational, you know, UI. Okay. Rather than coming through a search bar, pure question and answer, it started to morph into the conversation as, you know, Facebook emerged and all the, the, the chatbot world and all that buzz right. happened. It naturally just extended into, uh, you know, this conversational UI, but the same backend product really, uh, you know, served us well. So, so I, you know, it's a long way to say what, what we, you know, the product really is is a full service uh, conversational AI. So okay. we sell now to, to multiple industries, okay. you know, telcos, banks, insurance, government, tra- transportation, or, you know, some of the big ones. Gotcha. And um, we sell a full service. So we don't sell you a toolkit or a piece of software in the cloud. We sell it as a service. So from us, you buy conversational AI as a service. Okay. And, you know, there really are two parts to this market. One is the do-it-yourself, you know, toolkits that, you can buy from literally hundreds and hundreds of vendors, sure. you know, some of the best being, you know, Google and, and, uh, you know, Microsoft and Amazon and so, you know, so on, but many, uh, large enterprise, which is our focus, uh, you know, these large enterprise clients are realizing it's not a core expertise, like anything, you know, I'm a great bank, I'm a great insurance company, or I'm great telco, but I'm not great at this conversational AI world. And I want to buy a full service product. I want to buy the software. I want to buy, you know, all the tech. And I want to buy it uh, an optimization service where somebody's going to monitor my customer behavior, understand where it was able to satisfy the customers. Uh, if it didn't satisfy the customers, uh, you know, quickly diagnose why and optimize that system on on my behalf to make sure it improves every day. And that sure. is really what Wisdom AI is now. Interesting. No, I I love how you covered basically from the early days to today yeah. right because yeah yeah you basically it's, it's all have been, to you know, kind of one yeah it's, it's all been one path and and you know there's, there's this theme in all of it what we really sell is simplicity over and over and over we've sold this idea of making something easier is is what you know is what sold you know in uh, sort of a you know a theme through them all and, and i've had a few companies on the side that we've started up and uh you know worked on, on side projects but sure. uh, that's sort of been the, the mainstream of, of the, you know, the, the bigger companies. So how do you show, because simplicity is really, really hard. The, the simpler it is, it is so for hard. the user yeah. to use, yeah. the yeah. harder it is for the development team and the people, the other yeah. people working on the product, oh. right? Oh, we, we would have, you know, click, click free was the classic case okay. where, you know, we were, our target market, we would, we would identify would be like grandmothers. Okay. And, uh, you know, my, my mom was kind of the target audience. Sure. And uh, she's, she's not, you know, she's got a computer and an iPad and all that kind of stuff, but she doesn't want to do, you know, any kind of maintenance on the system. So sure. the idea was. And she shouldn't have to. Really, no, she should. Exactly. Yeah. You shouldn't have to, but you do, unfortunately. It's, yeah. it's you know, kind of the, just the state of the world is nothing ever works, but yeah. But you shouldn't have to. So making that so easy, and we, you know, we had a fairly big team, 100, 100, you know, 50 people, oh, wow. and uh, we'd sit with the product team, you know, every week, working on, you know, features and changes and modifications, sure. and uh, and everybody wants to add features. You know, sure. they're always like, if only we had this, it would do this wonderful thing. If we had that, it would do this wonderful thing. And the and the menus would get long, they'd get complicated, yeah. and and uh, and somebody said, if only we added a step here, it would do this, but it would it would pull away from the core. And it's amazing, even, you know, no matter how well you state the mission of the company, you know, the mission is that grand, you know, grandma can take this thing out of the box and back up without any confusion or complication, uh, you know, or questions. Still, people say, but only if we had this, it would be better. But if sure. only we had that. People are trying to <laughs> throw features in. And it, year, for years, we would battle and I would have to fight and say, you know, nothing. It still has to plug in and do everything and give you a big check mark or a thumbs up at the end and say it's done and you're safe. You can bury some things if you want, but that core purpose, yeah, you know, had to stay simple and clear. And it, it, it was amazing how hard that was. 
I, yeah, I can imagine. You'd probably get yeah. fought on that yeah. almost daily. It, it was. It was, you know, it was tiring sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, but we, we always stuck to it. And the thing was, you know, you know was really easy. Interesting. So I, I'm curious, though, to know what features and what, how have you navigated adding features and, and adopting new trends in technology? Because that in itself is very, very tricky. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, AI is the, you know, kind of the ultimate technology. Sure. Um, but again, from, from our perspective now in wisdom.ai, you know, because we sell this full service product, it's okay. fully managed. Uh, you know, what we really sell now is results. So we go into a large enterprise client and say, you're probably thinking about a conversational AI solution. Everybody is, if, you know, sure. if you don't, your competition is, uh, you know, going to launch before you and so on. So everybody is shopping and you look at the, the complicated world of AI. I'm going to go out and buy a product, you know, a, a toolkit or a, you know, a package of some form. I'm going to have to find the team internally. I'm going to have to train them, manage them, motivate them to, you know, to stay on, give this thing attention because they really need attention every day to, to really improve. Sure. And versus our sales pitch is we're going to sell you results. Okay. You know, you need this thing. You're going to need conversational AI. You're going to do web chat. Or you're going to do Facebook chat or, or you know, Twitter or, or text or email or whatever it is, or, you know, Alexa and Google assistant. Um, you're going to need that. But if you buy it from us, you're basically going to point us in the right direction. We're going to gather some information about your, you know, customer history and that kind of thing. And other than that, we're really going to take it off your hands uh, and we're going to sell you performance. There are, you know, there are three main things that we sell in our performance guarantees. We say, you know, the NLU side, right. our system will understand a certain percentage of everything your customers say. We're going to understand and match that to an intent and really know them well. And this is, you know, 70, 80, 90% typically. And we guarantee that because we're the, the operators. Got you. And then the, the second big metric we sell them, again, we guarantee is we will have a certain amount of containment. You know, customers will be inbound. In some cases, they might have talked to, you know, somebody in a store or somebody in the contact center. But we will guarantee you a certain level of those will be satisfied within the virtual assistant and won't ever, you know, need to talk to somebody. Sure. And, you know, and there's a massive savings. And the third thing is customer satisfaction. You know, everybody wants these things. And we will guarantee you a certain level of customer satisfaction. And, and to get those things, you know, basically you just have to engage and, and, uh, and buy from us. So you don't have all this complication of buying a toolkit you know, deploying it, hiring, managing, building a big team, trying to motivate them, and then trying to integrate that thing and, and think about the roadmap in the future. You know, from us, it's, it's relatively easy. Yeah. We're going to sell you these results for a problem that you've got that, you know, you need to solve. Yeah, they know we're they going have, to make right? it. Yeah. Yeah, everybody does these days. Yeah. So we really, you know, in a different way are selling simplicity in, you know, it's easy to buy from us. It costs more, of course, sure. because, you know, we've, it's a managed service. But uh, it really is effective and will we'll guarantee the results. Yeah, but they would have to build their whole – well, they would have to build a team internally yeah. or externally yeah. to actually build the product, yeah. which takes months or years, yeah. and then yeah. constantly maintain that and add features plus have people on their team using it. So you're really yeah. not that much more expensive. No, you're probably no. way no, cheaper, no, it, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, if you do okay. the cost benefit, okay. you know, okay. apples apples, it's it's a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah. But okay. compared to just buying a, a you know the software, uh, it's more mean. expensive. Yeah, I got you. But okay. yeah, if if you look at the total cost of ownership, it's a lot lower if you you know outsource us. Sure. Well, and then it's your problem to handle all yeah. those things I just mentioned. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we yeah we do it all and yeah. yeah and we make sure it works and you know and we actually you know uh, you know set up. Uh, you know, or we will take on the penalties. If we miss our targets, you know, we, we get penalized financially. I got you. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Yeah, that's it. It's, that's been our business model. It really became the core of our business. And it's, uh, you know, we're, as this industry matures, sure. people are realizing that the hard part isn't, you know, the tech and the AI anymore. Yeah. The hard part is make, you know, adding value to your company, you know, making this stuff work and, you know, as you talk to uh, people who've been in, you know, the IT business for for a while, CIOs of these bigger companies, yeah. they've all bought these massive software packages, right? Yeah. Millions and millions of dollars have been invested, and then they just they don't get the value. Yeah. You know, they get it takes a long time to set them up, plug them in, make them work, 
and then nobody pays attention, right? They don't get used, they don't get touched, yeah. and, and all this, the dream of all this, these wonderful things doesn't actually come true. And, and those people realize buying one of these products as a service really is effective, right? You know what you're going to get where, you know, you don't take the risk of, you know, the internal teams losing interest and moving on to the next shiny object and, and so on. So as this industry matures, it, it really, uh, you know, is working well for us. No, it makes a lot of sense. It's interesting that you bring that up because I don't want to say the company, but I ran into a guy, just me and a buddy were talking at the bar and the guy next to us was with his wife and they heard yeah. our conversation and we were at the same conference and we got talking and he yeah. told me that his team bought this multi-million dollar piece of software. I think if I remember correctly yeah. Yeah. from another company. So it was used yeah. because it was so expensive yeah. and they yeah. were on almost year 20, like almost two oh. decades oh. of migrating oh to this new piece of software. Like, uh, how insane yeah. is that? Yeah. Like, the iPhone is, what, 12 years old yeah. now? Yeah. 10, yeah. 11, 12 it, years old, something like that? Yeah. Like, oh, insane. Yeah. No, these big, yeah, these big, massive implementations, right? They almost never deliver the the value that they, you know, were promised years sure. before. It's just, they're just too big. It's, yeah. You know, they're, they're unmanageable. So, uh, so it, it really is, you know, the, the environment is a good one with, you know, new technology, AI, especially, you know, it really is a, a, you know, a complex world. You want to make sure you've got the best, but most importantly, it's, it's about adding value to the business. And sure. it's not about the buzz of the AI. It's about what's it going to deliver for sure. me and how's it going to add value to, you know, to my business and my, my customers. And, uh, and by taking that, that, you know, spin or, you know, presenting it that way, we're finding it's really working well. No, it makes a lot of sense. So I'm curious, though, to get your thoughts on this, because AI has been around for a long time in some different version, and it's going to keep continuing to grow. But it seems like we have these hot buzzwords that come up every few years, and AI seems to be the big one. And I'm not saying it isn't relevant, but at the end of the day, in your experience, do companies and your customers really care what it's called or what vertical or what buzzword is tied to it? They just want to know or solve problems in their business and they really don't care how you guys solve them. Do yeah. You know what I'm trying to get of. at? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of true and, and kind of not. Okay. Uh, you know, from, from one hand, um, like you say, the AI part, isn't critical to it. You know, if you look at our business, you know, we have a lot of machine learning models and, and sure. deep learning in the background that, that, uh, you know, interpreting the customers and we've got models that determine, you know, massive amounts of customers were satisfied or not satisfied and, and, and clustering together the, the failures and all these models have been built and the, our clients, you know, the enterprise, yeah. they don't really care that much. They like hearing about it. They say, Oh yeah, tell me about it and all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, if it performs, they don't really care too much about what model you use and if it's actually the, you know, the most, you know, leading edge or bleeding edge or whatever. On the other hand, they all know, you know, that AI, you know, machine learning, deep learning uh, is changing the world sure. and that their competitors are probably out there dabbling and it is a pretty big leap forward. Okay. It's enabling things that we could never do before. You know, you, you just couldn't do this stuff five years ago. Sure. And, so it, it's enabling all these new, uh, you know, functions or features or business processes that weren't possible. You know, it, it, you know, say five years ago, if I'm a bank, for example, okay. and I think about, you know, determining the risk of, you know, giving a loan. Yep. And in the past, you know, you had some analytic system or, you know, a bunch of people stare at us and say, okay, you know, Kevin, I, I know, you know, you filled out a form and I know your income and, you know, you, your price of your house and, you know, your payments and that kind of thing. And I, I tried to understand if I should give you a loan or not. Right. Now, everybody understands that the, the machine learning or deep learning models that do that analysis are just way more effective. Yeah, they really will determine where you should give credit and where you shouldn't, which is you know the core of being a bank. And if you don't adopt that technology, you really will give all your customers, you know, all the best you know, clients or you know, customers up to your competition. Sure. You'll be left giving a bunch of bad loans and you'll probably go to business. 
So, so people do realize AI is the foundation or is behind all these great leaps forward. You know, okay. we couldn't, well, that's good, we then. couldn't, yeah, we couldn't create a conversational AI, um, you know, with the technology five years ago, you know, with basic logic basis, it gotcha. couldn't be done. So they understand now that AI really is the magic in the background, but, they don't need to know all the nitty-gritty. They love hearing about it. Okay. Um, but they want to take advantage of, of these great benefits. Yeah. And they want it yesterday, right? They call oh, you always, today, always. but they're like, well, yeah, can you implement yeah. it yesterday? And you're like, well. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and not even that. You know, it, we, we sell to the enterprise market. And it's, sure. it's not a fast sales cycle. No. You're okay, talking to sure. them for six months. Sure. Six months, you're talking, you're talking, talking. And then they want it yesterday. Yeah, yeah I got exactly. you. So, That's about sounds about right, right? Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's just how it is. So I'm curious though, do you have any personal thoughts or predictions of where some of this stuff might go in the next three to five years? Yeah, yeah, you know, all the analysts, I, I wouldn't argue too much with the the basic analyst opinions okay. of our particular space, you know, conversational AI. So sure. so Everybody says, say, 80% of customer inter- interaction with brands are going to be handled by an AI. Okay. And at first you think 80%. So if I talk, you know, if I'm going to the mall and I want to, you know, I go to the Apple store, well, Apple is a nerd tech company, but sure. if I'm going to buy some shoes and I say, you know, what are the right shoes for me? Um, you know, or anything where you might have talked to a person in the past, you know, 80% of the time an AI is gonna, going to uh, handle that. And you think, ah, that seems like a lot. And it's a short time. You know, people say two to three years, not even five. Sure. And, uh, but it is moving so fast. It's really true that, you know, the technology today is pretty amazing. We can really understand so much of what that customer actually means, you know, when they, when they say certain things and we have a conversation with, with that customer, what did they really need? What was their challenge or interest? And uh, it's amazing how fast these systems learn and, you know, and they're getting more and more natural. You know, we're mostly text-based today, but the voice stuff is coming so fast just behind, Uh, you know, two years from now, we really are going to have a, you know, it's, it's just, it's really moving fast. That's the most amazing thing in, in this industry. And we're, we're close to it, of course. Um, And a lot of our clients are getting out there and, you know, relative relatively early days and we're satisfying a massive amount of clients but they really are going to hit 80 percent everybody we're working with right now within the next two to three years you can sure. see it clearly so it really is coming it's it's you know it's going to be a massive shift in how we all interact with brands and, and we'll, we'll all be used to it i guess and not expect anything different yeah no that's fair and i i also assume though that if i if I have my own, say, health data or personal data with stuff like past shoes I've bought in or sizes or I uh-huh. have an arch or no arch or, or like specific yeah. things to me that if I could yeah. literally just say, okay, you're in this shoe store, you're buying shoes, do you want to yeah. allow them this pieces of your personal data right. because we yeah. could basically yeah. give you – yeah. you know, 20 pairs of shoes that this store sells right now and guide you to them that will fit you perfectly. A lot of people yeah. I think will do that. Right. And maybe it's anonymous, yeah. maybe yeah. it's not anonymous, but yeah. something yeah. like that to me, I think people get scared by it, but I also think yeah. at some point, a lot of people will be like, you know what? I like this convenience yeah. and I'm willing to yeah. sacrifice a yeah. bit of personal data to get yeah. this convenience. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and today, you know, I think we're going to see a shift, you know, today, okay. uh, you know, Facebook and Google, all these guys are vacuuming, uh, vacuuming right. up so much data and, uh, and all the brokers in the background are vacuuming up so much data about us. And it's, it's unknown to all of us, right? We're all fear it because it's really, right. it's out there somewhere. People know so much about us. Um, you know, even, you know, theoretically, they're looking at the conversations, right? Some of those latest leaks yeah, and things yeah. like that. Sure. So, so it's, it's scary stuff. And I don't know, you know, the transition would be tough and it may be impossible, but one day there may be some kind of an open data broker that really is crystal clear that says, I really have all this information about you, Kevin, right? We know, we know everything from your shoe size and your arch type and your, you know, home address and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully you will have the control and say, I agree, I'm going to share the relevant data with the shoe store. And if I'm going to get a loan or a mortgage, I agree, I'm going to share the relevant data with, with this company. And, 
And like I say, I may give up some of that information for convenience in other ways, like, you know, advertising theoretically or sure. free services of, of other signs. But I think we're going to see more control end up in the hands of the consumers in controlling our data. Right now, it's, it's Wild West. Sure. And 20 years from now, people are going to say, whoa, like, how did anybody ever put up with that? The transition from here to there is going to be a tough one. But I think it's natural that we we will end up taking control back. We still will offer it, but we'll offer it, you know, on, you know, with our own consent. We'll actually know when we've when we've given up our the rights to all this personal data. Yeah, no, I hundred percent agree. But Ian, we're coming to the end of the show, so let's ah. close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and uh, Wisdom AI. Uh, yeah, you can, you know, Wisdom AI, of course, W Y S E O M dot AI is our uh, website. Um, you can always reach me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, always happy to chat with uh, other entrepreneurs and, and people interested in the space. Um, you know, so that's where you can reach us. Perfect, Ian. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot, Kevin. It was great being here. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.